And hello again. Final session of day two of the FDF Science to Practice Forum. We're going to be talking about resilient communities in the next little while, and we'll start all that off by visiting another hub, the penultimate one of our video tour of Australia. And that hub is Southern New South Wales. It's actually one where I was lucky enough to spend some time recently to make the video that you're about to see and to talk with the people that you're about to hear from. And this particular visit to Southern New South Wales begins just after dawn with the voices of two farmers. Drought is a fact of farming in this day and age. It's something we have to be organised for, prepared for, and uh, ready to jump when it does happen. People are wanting to, you know, to seek out more information and, and upskill themselves for their own businesses, and we're really trying to facilitate that. And, and the, the hub is going to be you know, a critical link in, um, in that process. I'm Cindy Cassidy, Director of the Southern New South Wales Drought, Resilience, Adoption and Innovation Hub. I'm not a person from the department, I'm a person from Southern New South Wales. Um, my family are farmers, I live and breathe the issues that, the lifestyle that is regional New South Wales. In reality, drought is such a, a feature of our agricultural and regional communities that a conversation about drought or the impacts of drought is never very far away. I actually think the real opportunity is how we create diversity in our regional communities and in our small towns, so how we buffer our small towns in the same way that our farmers have become adept at buffering themselves. One of the key functions that our hub has is bringing our research community and our farmers, um, community members and um, other agribusinesses together to say, actually, what's the value we all bring? And how do we respect the learnings and the understandings that each of the players in the system have to um, create a better outcome? We live in the community, so uh, the people that we're doing re research for are our friends and family. So we're always talking at the pub or at the coffee shops with uh, our, our friends and families about what, we're, what they're doing and how it might impact uh, on their farming businesses, for example. By thinking about uh, drought and innovation all the time, we can be better prepared for what's thrown at us in the future. We've got a big team of postgraduate students and we've got both the best people from around the world as well as our local stars as well. We're probably looking for it. Yeah. A big part of what we do is about practice change. So there's no point us coming up with our own bright ideas and trying to impose them on the farming community. We spend a lot of time listening to farmers, listening to the whole supply chain to understand what their pain points are and trying to solve them. And that way, if we do make a breakthrough in those areas, those breakthroughs are, are welcomed with open arms. The researchers are able to actually undertake activities that have got real on the ground meaning and, and people who are deeply interested in the outcomes of that. And there's nothing more satisfying than knowing what you're doing is going to be used and valued. It is almost lab to paddock, but I would actually think of it more of a circle, right, than a straight line. So it is, how do we bring all of those people together in a collective? Scales and everything, but yeah, right. you could not put a proper trial. That's the grading road. So the Southern New South Wales Innovation Hub is very much built on a hub and spoke type model where, yes, the, the, the hub is in Wagga Wagga, uh, but the Farming Systems Group Alliance is really important in being the spokes and being the conduit out into the, into the regions. Absolutely, trust has to be earned. That's part of you know, how I see that the role of you know, organisations that are, that are linking the farmers to the hub is that you know, we hopefully have the trust of our members uh, and they trust us when we bring knowledge back from the hub that um, they fully trust us to be able to apply it in their own businesses. The last drought uh, was a very prolonged one and if it taught us anything, it's that being organised um, in advance is the only way to go. Knowing what your plan's going to be when it happens is crucial to the overall outcome. I guess I've seen both sides. I, I've worked in science uh, and I am a farmer. The Southern New South Wales Innovation Hub is a real unique opportunity in that it's bringing all parties to the fore together 
to talk about drought resilience and build a common understanding uh, and, and clear communication pathways across organisations. And that's something that, particularly farming systems groups, we haven't really had that clear co connectivity with the organisations before and it's something we're really looking forward to developing. Starting an organisation from a blank sheet of paper takes time. At the beginning there was a degree of caution, let's call it, and as time has gone on and we've been able to make some progress, we're seeing um, people become more and more interested in how they can be involved. So there's been a lot of behind the scenes work that we've had to do, and I would say that what I've experienced with our people is enormous patience and enormous goodwill. We're ready to take the next step now, so, so it's very, very exciting. Just some of the people of the Southern New South Wales hub there. Sydney Cassidy was, is the director. I spoke with her in Tamora. Now she's come to Canberra to join me here to set up our showcase. Is it still very, very exciting? Very exciting, yes, absolutely. And seeing all the other hubs in action over the last couple of days has been fantastic as well, hasn't it? Absolutely wonderful. Anyway, it's now the chance of Southern New South Wales to shine, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. I'm actually really pleased to um, introduce to you today uh, Jo Eddy, who is from Rural Scope. This afternoon she's going to be talking to us about um, people-focused, values-based um, engagement. So we've taken a really, well you can see, see from our video, a really people-centric approach to our hub, to our engagement. and. Um, I've been lucky enough to know Jo for a few years through a leadership program that she ran and um, her focus is very much about how to create influence and impact and we really tapped into those skills and that, that insight um, in the Southern New South Wales hub and brought Jo on to give some advice and direction to our leadership team but also to work with our extensive um, knowledge broker network and really work with them around co-design and how we can bring our people and our communities together so that we're building um, their skills in designing and creating their own future right now and those skills and that vision will last them beyond the life of our hub. So we're really excited to have Jo as part of our team and I'll hand you over to Jo now. So thank you. Thanks so much Cindy and a huge hello to everybody right around the country. Um, you know big hellos from me here in South Gippsland in Victoria. I am coming to you from a chilly part of the world but somebody told me today that uh, up in Queensland, there was a minus two at 5 a.m. So that certainly pips us and makes me feel a little bit warmer. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm delighted to be sharing just 10 quick minutes with you today. And I want to share and then I can share, inspire, motivate and place uh, on the table the idea that mindsets are the key uh, thing that we need to work with. Uh, if we are truly committed to the development of resilient and innovative rural communities. So like many of you, I live in one. I uh, was born into one. I was born uh, the fifth child in a dairy farming uh, family. And it was there that I credit my interest um, at a very young age in mindsets. Um, I think it's fair to say that I was born into a fairly contemporary, um, traditional type of a region where my family uh, was pretty keen on staying with the status quo, uh, not so keen on innovation and creativity. And certainly um, I think I fit within that creative stream and life became a little bit tricky for my parents when I was in about the year 10 uh, space and the school wondered whether there was a better place than Langatha High School for me, but I digress. So I wanna share with you right from the get go that mindset is not a difficult concept to come to terms with. It is basically around the beliefs and the perceptions and the attitudes that we hold near and dear for us. And mindsets are a shifting continuum. So there is no place uh, and there's no such thing as having a fixed mindset. We can actually move and as facilitators and supporters and funders and investors, we can support people to move those mindsets into the more resilient and innovative mindsets that we know are required. Um, so I do want to inspire you, so I hope I'm going to achieve that. Um, and I do want to bang on um, pretty much about the need for mindsets to shift in our rural community so that innovation can in fact develop uh, and flourish and the importance that we all have 
um, to be able to do that. So if I go back, I think it's around six months or so, I joined um, the Southern New South Wales Innovation Hub and together with the leadership team there, we spent time looking at models of co-design and we went international. So we went to have a look at uh, juvenile justice system and we had also a look at the mental health system um, here in Australia. And what we learned from those systems was that they're complex. And in our group, which also included people from Denmark, uh, we learned that agriculture is seen by many and rural communities are seen by many as extremely complex systems. So we need different ways of developing resilience and collaboration than what we've been using to date. Um, because some of us would, would come from the view of we can do better. Um, and from my perspective today, it's about shifting mindsets um, to help us do that. So if you're interested in that co-design space, and I know many of you will be, and some of these names might be familiar, um, but the people that we most closely drew upon um, was Dr. Emma Blomkamp, uh, Liz Sanders from the US, who basically started the co-design kind of, you know, concept and movement. We also uh, looked at the work of Ingrid Burkett, who's based at a uni in Queensland, and also Kerri Ann McKercher, uh, who works out of New South Wales. And just a, a plug for her resource as well, um, Kerri Ann is the author behind this book, which is Beyond Sticky Notes, um, which is important, um, I think, when facilitating in, in rural communities. And then there were two organisations that we drew work from. One was the CoLab Design Centre in Auckland and New Zealand, and the other one was in South Australia, um, which is the Australian Centre for Social Innovation. So I quickly give you that one minute today to show you that we, we did some homework. You know, we didn't just start with um, who we were and the information that we had. We did go searching for uh, different ways of, of principles of co-design, co-design process, and mindsets kept coming up again and again and again um, to the extent that we couldn't ignore it. So what I want to do now, and I'm just keeping an eye on time for you all, is I actually want to invite you to um, come with me on an activity around mindsets because I can stand and chatter, um, but I want to give you the experience of having a look at a simple mindset tool and how you might be able to use this tool when you next go to facilitate things in your rural communities, whether it be part of your hubs or beyond. Um, so I can't see you all because, but normally I'd say, hey, raise your hand if you're happy to have a go. I am going to assume um, that you've got your hands up saying, yes, Joe, really happy to come along uh, with this activity. Let's get cracking. So could you grab a pen and grab a piece of paper, uh, an A4 will be fine or half an A4 will be fine and then just lay it on the table in front of you um, in the landscape position. And now I want to ask you just to, to write some words. So we're going to write words down the left-hand side of the paper, um, and these are the words that I want you to write. Um, scarcity is the first word. Underneath scarcity is fixed. Underneath fixed is dependence. Underneath dependence is design for and to, and I'm sure I can hear somebody even though I can't say slow down, Joe. so I'll just take a second. Uh, under design for and to is expert led and under expert led is teach slash advise. So down the left-hand side of your page, you'll have scarcity, then fixed, then dependence, then design for two, then expert led and teach advice. So now let's go to the right hand side of your landscape paper and opposite scarcity on the right hand side, please write abundance. Underneath abundance, can you please write growth? And under growth, write partnership and under partnership design with, under design with user led, and the last one is coach slash learn. So I'll read them from top to bottom. Abundance, growth, partnership, design with, user led, and then coach and learn. 
And now put a line from scarcity to abundance and we want an arrowhead on the line pointing to abundance. And do those lines for all of these other um, mindsets. So we have scarcity to abundance, we have fixed to growth, we have movement and we want to see shift from dependence to partnership, from design for and to to design with, and then a line between expert-led to user-led and a line between teach and advise to coach and learn. So it's the right-hand side of the continuum that re, um, resilience and innovative communities and businesses and teams need to have. These are the elements that are important. These are the mindset shifts um, that are important for you know, the community to have businesses, etc. So scarcity, as many of you will know and be familiar with, is when you're worried of miss you're worried about missing out. So we either have one, uh, it's a continuum. So we start with scarcity and we're looking at moving our mindset and other people's mindset and the mindset of a community to that right hand side of the continuum. So I invite you now just to mark where you think and how you think you show up in the world now on each of those continuums. Do you think you show up with abundance? If you do, then mark your uh, continuum with a cross to the right-hand side. If you think, oh, I'm pretty fixed, I like kind of things the way they are, don't like to move in, in, in a hurry, then pop your X or your cross on the continuum more to the left-hand side. And just take a moment now to do that for the other six continuums that I've shared. This is just for you. It's not something that you need to share with the people around you. It's not something that you necessarily um, need to share because I know some of you are in a hub with others at the moment. Um, it's not something that we, we need to do. This is for you. I invite you to use this awareness tool to understand where your mindset um, is sitting and then to use this tool, especially at the beginning of working with a group for the first time um, in your communities, ask them, hey, where are your mindsets? How are you showing up today? Um, you know, are you showing up with more of a fixed mindset or more of an abundant mindset? Uh, are you showing up with um, scarce, sorry, scarcity or abundance or are you showing up more as fixed or are you open and, and growth orientated? Dependence is a really interesting one because um, funding and dependence, I think we have seen go hand in hand in our rural communities and popping more funding or investing more money into rural communities may, may be contributing to the development of a, of a dependent uh, type of a mindset. We would be looking to shift our uh, rural communities into developing more partnership mindsets where they're equal partners to the processes that are engaged. The design for or the design to is the mindset that we've come from, which is where consultants will do stuff for us and we will often pay them for that or always pay them for that. Or people or governments will do things to us. Um, we want to see the mind shift move towards designing with those with um, lived experience and the end users in our communities so that they become ambassadors and champions for the change. And to do that, they need to have that opportunity to be part of the design process. Um, the next one, expert-led, I think to user-led is, is pretty self-explanatory. Um, I can remember so vividly my dad at one point coming home from a meeting saying, oh, my gosh, in more expletive words, look at what they want us to do now. Who do they think we are? Um, and I implore all of you to take into account that there are people with lived experiences um, who have come through drought and they are the experts in this area. Um, we, we can draw on them for the information that we need to develop product and service. And the last one is, you know, coach and learn is where we want to go. We want to open up the gates to innovation. We want to open up the gates to resilience. And uh, it is the descriptors down the right-hand side, the traits down the right-hand side, that I think we all have a responsibility to support, encourage, facilitate, 
and uh, lead our rural communities and the people within our rural communities to have a go and be part of the change process rather than be in that um, place where it's done to us or done for us. We're looking for facilitators to work more carefully um, to design processes, especially with complex systems like rural communities, um, to design with us. So I hope that I have been able to share that quick tool with you in a way that was easy to understand and easy for you to um, develop some awareness around the importance of mindsets. And I want to leave you with um, the thought that shifting mindsets and changing paradigms, some of you will be familiar with that word, is key to influencing change, but it's actually one of the hardest things to facilitate. So it's any wonder um, that it's a, it's a difficult process and that we're not all putting up our hands to, uh, to be ready with the tools to, to support our rural communities. Um, if you look at those words down the right-hand side, abundance, growth, partnership, designing with, user-led and coach learn, who among us wouldn't want our rural communities to um, be, be in debt or not endemic, but have all of those things in play? Um, certainly it would be fantastic if all of our rural communities had mindsets that had those traits as part of them. So in closing, I want to leave you with a thought that has come from the work of Dr. Brene Brown, who's a social researcher in the US. And she shares really strongly that there is no place in the future for leaders who are technically or scientifically proficient only. Um, what is required is leaders who will possess the innovative mindsets and the ability to support others to shift mindsets um, and I think we all have a role definitely to play in that area. So thank you so much for having me today. I hope I've inspired you to, you know, go off and have a little bit more of a, a play with mindsets and hopefully to use that very short tool that I've given you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Joe, and thanks very much for getting us working with the A4. We're all doing it here, six of us. Right. And... I hope you're all doing it wherever you are, because it actually makes you stop and think, which is not a bad place to start. Joe, a few questions for you before you uh, disappear. Uh, Christine Orgie's asking, we live in communities, and if the broader community mindset is stuck, but you feel your personal mindset needs to move on and embrace change, how do you change your mindset while staying part of that community? It, that's quite a common point of tension in, in smaller communities. Yeah, what a great yeah, question. A great question. Um, and something I know that we, we feel and uh, we work with in our own communities. <coughs> please, please, please continue to be who you are. It's the authentic way that you show up. Uh, embracing the mindset that you have that will allow people to want to connect uh, to you and hopefully you'll become a magnet for other people who will go, wow, I want more of what she has um, and they will gravitate towards you. It can be a lonely place, of course, if you are the first person to develop mindsets down that right-hand side um, but please then accept the invitation that I offer you today, which is to assist other people to move across that mindset continuum. And a lot of that will happen through chat and a lot of that can happen, um, as I said, by showing up as, as the authentic self. And I guess as well, it's not one thing or the other. There's a huge grey area in the middle. There is another yeah. continuum. Yeah. And actually, that's a really good point because it's getting comfortable with the uncertainty that's important. And we often work with, you know, black and white. And I'm forever saying to people, come with me into the grey. You know, it is neither fixed nor open. Come with me into the grey and let's move forward together. Come with me to another question, Joe. Um, uh, one of our anonymous questioners is asking, it sounds like you've been working in this space for quite a while now. What new opportunities does partnering with the hub open up? Sorry, what was the last point of that question? What, does, what new opportunities for you that partnering with the hub open up? The specifics, I guess, that the hubs present as a challenge. Yeah, if I understand the question rightly, um, I have to say that in my 
20 years of um, being in commercial practice, if you like, and having a consulting business, this is one of the most exciting times I've had since being asked to, to join the hub on this um, because it's truly transformational work. Um, and that's the life I come from. Um, and I want to see in our rural communities, that's my life's work. And I haven't been as excited about this change process, um, you know, since since I started 20 years ago. In saying that, though, um, you always know when you're onto a good thing when resistance happens. And um, and I just encourage you again in communities that when resistance happens, it's it's usually because you are onto a good thing and people don't necessarily uh, feel that they've got the the mindset to come with you at this point in time. Stick at it. And as we've done in the Southern New South Wales Hub, we went internationally to have a look at models um, because this is cutting edge stuff and we certainly didn't want to, I hope I'm correct in saying this, we didn't want to fall into that, offer up the funding, get content and technical projects happening, which gets you know the job started on the ground. We wanted to start with the people first. Um, so it's about people, it's about process, it's about practice, it's about principles. Um, and I can't stress that enough, people first. Thank you, Joe. which also echoes what Chris said in the video as well. It's no good that stand and deliver idea and then leave it on the table and walk away. Jodie, yeah. you've given us terrific food for thought. You've got us using our brains in the mid-afternoon, which is a triumph in of itself. Thank you so much for your part in showcasing some of the work being done in southern New South Wales. Thanks for your time. Good luck, everyone. Thanks, Joe. Now it's time, as we talk about resilience, for talking about growing farmers' well-being online. Um, we're going to hear from Dr. Kate D uh, Gunn, who we heard from uh, at this event last year with the iFarmWell app. It was one of the standout features of last year's event. Uh, iFarmWell is a free online toolkit which helps farmers cope effectively with the challenges that come with life and getting the most out of every day, regardless of the circumstances they're facing. It's designed, and here's the rub, based on what Australian farmers say they want and what research says they might need. But to expand on this and tell us how far she's travelled in the last 12 months, Dr Kate Gunn, nice to see you again. Kate, take us away with your presentation. Thanks, Andy, and great to be here again. Yeah, so I grew up on a farm near the Minipa Drought Hub in South Australia, and I love spending time there with my family. But I work as a Senior Research Fellow in the Department of Rural Health at UniSA, and I'm a clinical psychologist and, um, as you just heard, the founder of iFarmWell. So iFarmWell is a free online resource designed to help farmers learn practical strategies to get the most out of life, regardless of the circumstances they face. So we're just going to play a short clip that explains how iFarmWell works. So this is Annie, who's a farmer in Victoria, explaining how doing the five free modules helped her. I just think that there was a muddle in my life, in my head, and I think iFarmWell sort of sorted it all out. And it's just brought me a lot of peace. I can put my energy into what's important, but not sweat the small stuff, not worry about the crap and things that, you know, I like my windows are dirty, but that's fine. I know how to wash them. I will wash them, but at the moment it's not my high priority. Sorry. So last year at the Drought Forum, um, I spoke to you about how we carefully co-designed iFarmWell with farmers from across Australia and how the evaluation showed that completing the five modules reduces farmers' distress it increases their well-being, and that those gains are maintained for at least six months after they've done the last module. And I also talked to you about how we mapped out farmers' barriers to adoption of iFarmWell, and some of the strategies that we'd implemented to help overcome these, such as the um, iFarmWell podcast, the use of testimonial videos, and training people like rural financial councillors across Australia on how to respond and to recognise distressing farmers and how iFarmWell can assist them to improve their clients' decision-making capacity and um, drought resilience. So in the last 12 months, um, we redeveloped iFarmWell on a new platform and added new features based on feedback. 
For example, we now have an invite a client feature for people working directly with farmers, people like agronomists, so they can refer their clients to iFarmWell and monitor and encourage their, um, client, their farmer clients' progress through the modules. We also have a lend a hand to a mate feature, which gives people an easy way to invite another farmer to sign up to iFarmWell and to offer support uh, to support them through the modules. So what both of these features mean is that with user's permission, the supporter will be notified by email when a user's completed a module and then be prompted to give them a call um, and ask them a few suggested questions. And what this does is help to reinforce the key learnings and um, keep the person accountable and really ensure that they do make those meaningful changes in their life. We've also been really busy connecting with people and organisations who share our passion for improving farmers' wellbeing um, so that we could partner with them in spreading the word about our free resources, for example, in their newsletter and on their social media channels. So now we've had hundreds of farmers across Australia who've done the iFarmWell modules, just like Annie did, um, but we know that there are thousands more who could benefit from an increased ability to manage effectively and make good decisions, particularly when there are things like the weather that they can't control. So uh, thanks to funding from the Federal Drought Fund, we're now rolling out two new initiatives to help us increase the reach of these important strategies. The first project is um, based in the Loxton region of South Australia and it's called Vocal Locals. So this is actually building on the success of a musical production that was performed by members of the Loxton community in October last year. And it's a, the music was written by a very talented um, local Loxton grain grower, John Gladigo, who's also heavily involved in the Local Vocals project. So the musical was called Kick Off Your Boots and it incorporated many of the key I Farm Well messages and was also all about celebrating rural life and exploring challenges that are commonly faced by farming families, things like succession planning. And it also very cleverly demonstrated practical ways that farmers can effectively manage in really difficult circumstances. So now Vocal Locals was building on that by continuing the conversation about mental health in the Loxton region and building drought resilience using evidence-based strategies from iFarmWell, along with the power of social media and the faces um, that other locals know and trust. So the way that we're doing this is um, there's 10 members of the Loxton community who are in the process of becoming vocal locals. And to become a vocal local, what they need to do is um, do the iFarmWell modules, uh, a one day orientation session, and then participate in weekly coaching for eight weeks with a local wellbeing coach, um, Tanya Lehman. And the purpose of this is to support them to identify and progress their own wellbeing related goals. But then importantly, what they'll next do is share what they learn on social media so that other members of their community can see what the vocal locals are doing to improve and maintain their well-being. And most importantly, so those other community members um, can learn how to improve their own lives. Um, we'll also be educating the community about services that are available in their region and also how they can support someone um, they think might be suicidal or having a hard time. So this campaign has just begun. Um, you might like to follow it on Facebook yourself, just search Vocal Locals. And um, it's a collaboration between the Federal Drought Fund, FRRR, iFarmWell, Grain Producers SA, Primary Producers SA, uh, Mallee Sustainable Farming Systems, Little Town Productions, the Riverland Community Suicide Prevention Network, um, and uh, the Loxton Wakery Council. So we'll be measuring its impact and making the process and the protocol available to other communities um, who might like to test it out in the future. So that's a, one of our new projects. The second um, drought fund project that we now have underway is thanks to a proof of concept grant that we received in collaboration with the South Australian Drought Hub and Grain Producers SA and three farming systems groups. So AREP, Mallee Sustainable Farming and Upper North Farming Systems. And what this grant will enable us to do is to run in-person workshops at Minipur, Loxton and Oruru, three drought hub locations, and one virtual workshop for anyone who'd like to attend. And what we'll do is we'll get farmers from the farming system groups to identify a wellbeing topic that's important to them. And then we'll go away and put together some content um, and strategies based on psychological science, get feedback on all of that from farmers along the way, and then bring in a comedian to make the content as fun and engaging as it can be.
Um, we'll then build some new strategies, uh, sorry, some new features on the iFarmWell website to enable people to answer questions anonymously while they're in the workshops and also to enable the workshop participants to set up reminders to help them build important strategies into their lives. And most importantly, we'll then work with a local farmer in each region to deliver the workshop in their community. So I'll be there and can answer questions as a clinical psychologist, but what we think will be really powerful is for farmers to learn from other farmers about wellbeing related issues that are important to them. So if you'd like to know um, any more about how you can spread the word about the free iFarmWell resources in your communities or any of the new initiatives um, that we're rolling out, please do get in touch. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I'll leave it there and uh, go to questions, but I'd just like to finish by also acknowledging all of our project partners and the funders who make this important work possible. So thank you all. Thanks, Kate. I farm well, as I said, was a bit of a standout last year and the work continues. Keep the questions coming in. Uh, a couple have arrived already. Um, one asking, another anonymous questioner, What's been the most rewarding aspect so far of developing iFarmWell? Um, well, what I find amazingly rewarding is when I get out into the community and people tell me about the changes that we've um, enabled them to enact in their lives. So um, only last week I was speaking to a farmer who said he'd done the iFarmWell modules and um, he's so glad he did because it actually gave him some tools to um, give up drinking so much. And uh, soon after he'd enacted that, uh, a fire came through and his, his dairy was burnt out. And he said that had he not, not um, had those skills in place before the, came, the fire came through, things would have been much harder for him. So hearing those stories, um, you know, uh, certainly makes this all worthwhile. Um, it, it is an easy work, um, but, uh, you know, things like that uh, make me feel like it's, it's worth all those, those Ks and all those hours, that's for sure. And I'm guessing we talked yesterday about the peer-to-peer -peer education. This is, a, this is a space where it is absolutely vital for that individual to tell their friends, their family, that they couldn't have got through a disaster without the, the toolbox that you help provide. Yeah, that's right. So, and that's the feedback that um, that we received on the first version of the platform. People said they wanted it to be easier to share it with other people who might benefit. So, um, and they wanted to be involved in supporting other people that they cared about um, make progress through the modules. So, that that's exactly um, what the new features are designed to do. And we know the power of peer support um, uh, is something that we all, you know. Um, should be using to, um, to have impact. Another question here, you and your iFarmWell team go to a lot of effort to include farmers' preferences and voices when developing resources and strategies. Can you tell us a bit more of what, why you do that? And I, if I could add another question, getting the balance right between what people think they want and what people with expertise know they might need. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting, that's a really question. interesting question. So we know that um, a lack of understanding of, of the farming industry from outsiders is actually quite a, a great source of stress for farmers. So um, in everything we do, we really don't want to be adding to that stress. We want to be demonstrating that we really do get the stresses that they're faced with and, um, and we can speak their language and we do understand their way of life. And um, and I think getting through to this audience, um, you have to be able to speak their language. That they'll turn off pretty quickly as soon as there's any fluff or jargon or, or things that um, they see as irrelevant, you know, um, which, which is understandable. So, um, yeah, so what we do is we speak to farmers about what they, um, what they want from things. We then go away, combine it with the science, and then we present it back to farmers and get more feedback so that well, you know, that gives us the ability to adjust any of the, the content um, or any of the language that, that sort of misses the mark. So, um, I, you know, sometimes the farmer says, well, you're the expert, you're the psychologist, you, you know, you should be telling me, um, telling me that, you know, how to solve this problem. But um, we know it's certainly more powerful if we can work together um, to get those messages across in ways that are acceptable for our audience. 
working together so many times over the past couple of days we've heard about working together, whether it's developing practical solutions for soil and the like, or that community resilience. Kate Gunn, thank you so much. And you can see on your screen, ifarmwell.com.au. Uh, keep up the good work and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Andy. Now, next we have a panel. And the panel's gonna be discussing how do communities build and maintain, maintain being a very important word, their drought resilience. And uh, that panel is going to be in the hands of the knowledge broker for the Southern Queensland and Northern New South Wales hub and doctoral researcher in rural social dynamics at the University of Southern Queensland, Selena Ham. So Selena's there now. Selena, I hand the floor over to you for a panel discussion, which will be picking up, no doubt, on many of the topics and thoughts we've already heard in the last little while. Over to you. Absolutely, Andy. Thank you so much for that. And it's very inspiring hearing those previous speakers. Um, we are going to be looking at how communities build and maintain their drought resilience. Um, I'm coming to you from the uh, USQ hub and for the USQ based hub for Southern Queensland, Northern New South Wales on Yagara, Girabal and Jarawe country. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers who are joining the panel. Um, Natal Egelton is with a CEO with the Foundation for Regional and Rural Renewal. And this organisation is a delivery partner for Future Drought Fund Networks, looking at how to build drought resilience. It's a not -prof for profit organisation that describes itself as hyper local in the way they connect the community desires with funding from a range of sources from government, business, and philanthropy. Um, we also have Simon Milcock, who's the CEO of the Lagartis Group. And this is a peak regional local government organisation that focuses on the well being, wealth, the social cohesion of its communities in South Australia through sustainable productive landscapes and the natural environment. Uh, we are also going to be talking with Dr Jennifer Luke, who is a research fellow in wellbeing and employability with the Southern Queensland Northern New South Wales hub and she has been looking at applying uh, research to locate and develop toolkits that will support and strengthen the local resources of communities, looking at how to build on the capacities that already exist in those communities to build friendships networks of care and practical support. So having introduced my, my peers here, my first question really is to ask you guys, and I might start with you, Natalie, how do you define resilience? Thanks, Selena, and great to be with you all. Um, I uh, am with you from Jojo Run Country in Central Victoria, so um, lovely to be uh, in this group chat with you today. Uh, resilience is one of those words, isn't it, that gets bandied around a lot and, and can cause a fair bit of, um, you know, disagreement at times and uh, a bit of confusion at times. But the way I think about resilience and, and the way do it at RRR is really about um, the quality of the connectedness and the stretchiness um, in systems, in communities and in places. Um, you know, it's really um, not something that you necessarily have or don't have or, you know, need to increase or decrease. From, from my perspective, it's, it's really a dynamic balance of the qualities and conditions. You know, it's like a muscle that you can flex um, and that gets stronger um, or gets weaker depending on how much you, you put into it and how much you actually exercise those, con those connections and those, um, you know, those stretchy parts that, that help us to be able to cope when we are faced with disruption um, or with stressors. Um, drought is, you know, obviously one that calls on, you know, a really marathon um, kind of level of endurance um, and, yeah. you know, our resilience and that stretchiness and connectedness is, is what, you know, kind of is fundamental um, when we Fantastic. go through those kind of disruptions. Yeah. So Simon, um, Natalie's talked about it being, uh, resilience being something we need to exercise and keep well um, in, in terms of maintaining the stretchiness in the community. What, what's your thought about what resilience is? Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably come from, uh, and, and I, I want to acknowledge I'm sitting uh, today on Nadri land um, here in, uh, in regional South Australia in the, in the beautiful Clare Valley. Um, but, uh, but I think community resilience is where I'm coming from. And it's the continued ability of communities to withstand to adapt, 
and to recover from adversity. And a resilient community is socially connected, has both soft and hard infrastructure that can withstand disaster, uh, foster community recovery. Uh, and from a local government perspective, you know, we certainly have a key role to, to play in both that, that soft and that hard infrastructure within our urban environments. And uh, maybe as we go through today, we can explore that a little bit further. But I, I would put that's my understanding of what we're trying to do in support resilience within our communities. Thanks, um, Simon. And um, Jennifer, I'd like to ask you, because the reason I'm focusing on this is because I sometimes hear um, primary producers in particular say that they're sort of sick of hearing about resilience because it feels as though they have no choice about being resilient and they associate resilience with being stoic and sitting in a painful space, waiting for the storm to blow over and feeling as though they have to endure. So it's associated with disempowerment in some ways, rather than the things that Natalie and Simon have talked about, which is really about focusing on empowerment. What are your thoughts? Oh, thank you, Selena. Uh, and I would just start by saying um, that I'm currently sitting in the lands of the Jagera, um, Yagera and Yurikul people, uh, which is the Springfield Ipswich area, um, just west of Brisbane at the USQ campus. Uh, and I, it's been really good to listen to what Simon and Natalie have mentioned about resilience. I'd probably add um, with the resilience, because uh, the area that I'm focusing on is well-being and employability. So it's that community and workforce development. Uh, and the resilience, it is about the ability to cope. And you, you're right in what you were saying is that people are sick of having the word resilience used. And I think the big thing here, um, and this is also from having a, a lot of chats over the last few months with people from various uh, communities within regional and rural Queensland and New South Wales, uh, is that resilience is the ability to cope and persevere in times of stress and change, but it's personal, it's individual. And I think a, a big thing I'd want to highlight is that being resilient is about being able to adapt and that's dependent on the situation that you're in. And we have to make sure that no one, um, none of us, uh, government right through to whether it's um, educational facilities, uh, organisations going into communities, that we go resilience means this for the, you know, this whole town or this whole region. Resilience is individual because everyone has their own story. They have their own motivations. They have their, they have different things going on. People do not appreciate, no one appreciates being lumped into a group and being told, here's the solution. It will fix everything for you. Uh, you do not do that. Um, it is a case of you must listen to the community. You must listen to the individuals. Uh, and I would probably say uh, without, I could get on my soapbox <laughs> about this, but it's very much about resilience. It's very much about an individual. Um, and we have to be listening to people, to their stories, and making sure we don't fall into that trap of Fantastic. lumping everyone. Yep, so it, it's um, uh, very individual. And I'm wondering if, Simon, you um, have uh, some stories or, or from your experience um, of communities being successful in taking that unique approach to building their own capacity to be resilient. Yeah, and, and probably just to, to follow up on, on some of that conversation, I also think, I also think we're a little, we're, we're a little over-consulted at the moment uh, around resilience and drought um, and we're just going through a, um, a regional resilience plan at the moment and then someone's coming along to develop a, a resilience leadership program and they want to come out and consult and I've gone well if if we don't know what we've been doing you know through the last couple of years um, we're, we're never going to know and but but I think it's all also really interesting to uh, that, that concept of what works perhaps in one space, one place doesn't work in the other. Uh, and when we start to talk about a place like South Australia, how, do, how do, can we compare that to the Eastern states? You know, realistically, we have no regional cities. 
in South Australia. We're relying on Adelaide as our as our regional city. <laughs> but certainly, some of the some of the areas that we've been looking at um, is is around advocacy and the opportunity to. Um, but but again, I also think maybe some of our government agencies in the wellbeing space haven't always seen things like drought as being something that they get actively involved with. You know, why, why does it take primary industries and, uh, and regions in South Australia to be the ones to fund the family and business support mentors when it should really be a, a health issue? So certainly some of the, the advocacy work, we've seen opportunities and we're running a number of, um, uh, of community capacity building uh, projects, which is trying to empower and get away from some of the gatekeepers in our regional communities, because I think that's also something you know, we, ha we have people um, who this is the way it's always been done, so that's the way it's going to be done. So those they, they miss out on that opportunity. So, uh, so you know, just one of the projects we're working on at the moment is around a, a, a podcast program, which is helping communities tell their stories, which is going to which is empowering people who have not had that voice in their community. It's going to tell some stories which have a focus on tourism but also about the good, the good aspects of, of who they are as a community. And so I think sometimes when we start to think about the building capacity, we need to embrace all of the community and bring everybody along and, and not just sometimes those people who have been there for a long time who, who, who might be running everything. But yeah, they, thanks, so Simon. That sounds it. fantastic. So not a one size fits all and to help them to identify and hear their own voices, recognise their own uniqueness and be inclusive. Those are important things and be optimistic, I think you said as well, as important elements. Uh, just um, to you, Natalie, what, what story do you have to tell about capacity building successfully uh, in terms of gaining community resilience? Yeah, to pick up on Simon's comments around um, inclusion and um, diversity is really important as well. And, and I guess FRRR's um, work in the Future Drought Fund stream around networks to build drought resilience um, has been fabulous in terms of seeing those community-led and very place-based initiatives that are designed from within the communities that is right size, um, right context, um, but led by organisations that are really trusted and, and have that ability to bring in um, different parts of the community as well, both from a farming sector, but also from um, industry, not-for-profit, service providers, government, etc. cetera. Um, and I mean, there are lots and lots of great examples, but one that's um, rolling out at the moment that um, we're kind of watching and, and seeing some really lovely um, connections being made, which, you know, is, is that stretchiness, but how do you keep that, that network sort of um, capability and capacity happening um, is Riverine Plains. Uh, so they're, they're delivering a whole series of um, networking workshops um, across the Riverine Plains region. Um, and they're looking at things like the importance of communications with the family, um, with your banker um, and with yourself. So it has that sort of um, personal resilience and wellbeing focus, but also a range of skill development and, um, you know, capability development pieces. Um, and interestingly, and if I can just read a brief quote that I pulled out um, that they shared with us, because I think it says a lot about, you know, that... Um, that sort of value and resilience building effort. And they've said the region has had two consecutive wet seasons. However, now is a really opportune time to start thinking about the future as farmers are in a positive frame of mind and we've got reserves to start implementing long-term strategies. So there's this kind of um, spaciousness to think as well that I think is really critical when we're talking about resilience and, and really investing in resilience because it's really hard to do that work when you're absolutely under stress. Um, but doing this work and investing in that that sort of resilience capacity in our networks and relationships you know pays dividends when when those hard times do come if we do it now when we're in better times yes i think that is a pretty strong theme that's been uh, present throughout the whole science to practice forum which is the importance of preparation and being ready so that you can put um, um, things in the piggy bank both socially, environmentally and economically, um, being ready uh, and, and investing in that, which is what Simon has talked about, the importance of um, considering the benefits of investing in that in advance and having the support before there's, before primary producers, as one said to me, have entered the spiral of despair. 
um, which then affects their decision making capacity, which I think you can speak to, Jennifer. Your story, you do, I'm sure you have, um, you, I know that you have stories about um, people being able to um, uh, be, have a good mindset, as Joe Eady was talking about, so that they can cope with making good decisions in their business, hold down a job. Thank you, Selena. Um, I feel like you were in my head. You knew I was. Um, I had a couple of things. Uh, I will say first, the speakers that we've had on just before us, it's been fantastic because it's really led into the conversation we're having now. Uh, I'd probably just as a couple of quick examples of that resilience, and I'm tying in well-being as in it's both physical and psychological, uh, and well-being then leads into the other part of where I focus in research, which is employability, which really just means being ready for whether you're a job seeker or already working. So like a farmer, employability is just building on your self-confidence so that you can see where there's opportunities coming up. And so that's what I tie into resilience. It's those two things, well-being and employability. But uh, in terms of resilience, the two things I'll probably mention is one, uh, the research I was doing just as I was coming into uh, the role within the hub last year, um, which I'm also following through with a lot of the conversations now in community, is around the older workers. Uh, and um, in the case of an example I had was men's sheds. So very much around um, men's mental health. Uh, and this was particularly those that were close to retirement or had retired. Uh, and what was great about men's sheds uh, and that is, you know, whether they're formal or informal, uh, is that they are a place where you go uh, to work on hobby projects. And that's what a lot of people think, oh, okay, it's a bunch of guys getting together, but it builds their well-being through community because they're with others. They're building on their self-confidence, both psychologically and physically, uh, but also it's providing them purpose and builds opportunities. Uh, and that can be from well-being, but also I'm throwing in that employability because the people that I've spoken to both previously and even now is that sometimes that connection, uh, which gives them purpose, uh, is also opening up opportunities for them to re-engage with work as a mentor, whether that's paid or volunteer work. So they're giving back to the community and that's where resilience for them is having that uh, opportunity and having that self-confidence. So I just wanted to throw that in because mm. uh, men's mental health is a big issue uh, in uh, across Australia, but very much in the regional and rural remote communities as well. Uh, but the other one I'd just throw in there too is that during COVID, um, what came up in a lot of conversations I've had over the last few months with different community organisations, again, through uh, Queensland and in northern New South Wales was around the fact that COVID forced everyone online uh, and there were so many uh, members of the community, all ages, where it really became apparent that their digital literacy uh, wasn't very high. So everyone was forced to, they had to sign in, they had to have a mobile app, let alone uh, being able to use um, a lot of, you know, state government um, uh, online platforms where they mm. had to, you know, they weren't allowed to go into a physical location. And yes. so a lot of communities reached out uh, to their uh, community and offered them the ability to come in and be taught how to set up a lot of this. And it actually built a lot of new friendships, a lot of networks in the community. And Fantastic. that was another form of resilience. So they took the opportunity to actually build capacity by giving people skills and, and um, opening up new ways of engaging. I'm thinking that would have opened up social media and other ways of connecting. Another exactly. thing I heard you say was the importance of giving back to the community, which is you, something that's easier to do when you're in a good place yourself. And I think, Simon, you've had some experience with the importance of volunteering as a, as a critical fabric in the in, in small communities and rural communities. Mm. Yeah, and and I suppose, you know, and, and I live in the driest state, in the driest continent, in a region which is going to be the most impacted by rainfall deficiency uh, in, in, in South Australia. We've got the oldest demographics in Australia. Um, we have 
a significant volunteer base. I think we lead the we lead regional South Australia, if not South Australia, in volunteering. But the majority of those are in their 70s and 80s now. These are the people who are manning our volunteer services, our, 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 our ambulance services, our, our CFS and our ICS. So I think, I think it's a key role for us, and this is some work we're doing to support volunteering, is to look at what that change in volunteering will look like over the next five, 10 years, because we can end up with the most innovative farming practices in the world to deal with the impacts of rainfall deficiency and drought. But if we no longer have communities that are livable or have the ability to care for each other, then I question why are we doing this? So we need to, we need to really focus on what those changes to volunteering are going to be. We're seeing less and less volunteers as the farms get bigger and bigger. There's less and less people on the farms, but we're also getting that aged demographics and we're seeing a new cohort of people move to regional South Australia and I'm, and I'm sure that's around regional Australia who are coming from a metropolitan background who don't necessarily have that understanding of what volunteerism is. Um, and, you know, and people look at me a bit crazy when I say I'm a volunteer ambulance officer and they say, oh, well, so you just drive the, the ambulance for the paramedics. <laughs> And I go, no, I have to go and deal with what a paramedic would have to deal with. I don't have the same skill set or the ability to give drugs and things like that. Um, but it's not recognised necessarily around the role of volunteerism. And, and I think more and more we need to focus on what that will look like. Yeah. And I think the innovation hubs have a key role to play in that. Thank you. That's um, tremendous. And um, I think you're echoing another theme that we've heard, which is put people at the centre and create livable communities. It's really essential. And part of that is being able to embrace those newcomers. And we know in small and rural communities, sometimes there is a bit of resistance to newcomers. Uh, and perhaps that's aligned sometimes with sometimes some resistance to change because they're introducing new stories about wh what the community can be. I'm thinking, Natalie, that, uh, that you would have some um, ideas around the importance of livable communities because you're very focused on how the community defines the possible pathways forward that align with their unique understanding of themselves and what matters. Yes, if I can get myself off mute. <laughs> um, I, I really concur with all those comments and, and the volunteerism picture is quite different, isn't it, in remote and rural communities. Um, mm. you know, they really are the lifeblood of service provision. Um, farmers are usually volunteers, volunteers, um, and, you know, they wear many hats. They might be um, on any number of committees and quite possibly on all the committees in a town. Um, so when we think about livability and we think about... Um, inviting newcomers in and when we think about um, how to sustain places um, there are you know a whole range of dimensions um, but some of the I guess some of the tangible things can be about um, place making initiatives you know in terms of community infrastructure and you were talking about the digital divide and capability uh, leap that we've needed to make in the last couple of years and um, some of the things that we um, support at FRRR and have supported through the Networks program um, are things that have that multiplier effect um, of both um, adding livability, so it might be an upgrade to a community hall that involves um, improving the technology um, provision, you might have internet hub in there, you might have um, AV equipment so that events can be held there and meetings, etc. cetera. Um, it might be a training place so that um, people can come in and learn how to use things. Um, you might also put a good dishwasher in there and a few things that um, alleviates the pressure on volunteers to have to actually do everything. Um, or it might be things like um, buying a marquee um, that, you know, can be owned by the community and used by all the community groups so they don't need to travel and hire something every time there's a function. So, you know, they all create that, um, you know, efficiency, but it's also about easing the burden on people running things and using their time in a way that's um, more effective uh, and really leveraging the assets of the community. 
Um, so I think, you know, that's that's one example um, of the, I guess, the benefits of hard infrastructure on soft infrastructure, to use some of Simon's terminology. Yes, exactly. And um, also I'm noticing um, the that in-person connection is fantastic, but we're now finding online connection can also be valued when, when in-person connection is uh, not easily accessible. Um, I'm wondering if, from your experience, um, Simon, if there is something we need to do differently or to build on to help support communities' resilience and capacity? Yeah, look, that's um, one of the things we, we identified that it wasn't necessarily, we, we thought it was going to be youth that were the ones who were not necessarily engaging in volunteering, but it was actually the, the gap was in the 25 to 44 year old uh, age group. Um, so we live in a different world now than what we did 20 years ago um, mm. and you know with the with the with the need for um, you know for all members of the family almost to be working um, and having that time to to spend so whether we and this is a discussion we're having with volunteering SA in Northern Territory and will be the the focus for uh, conversations later this year um, but looking at whether there's a need to even look at something like the um, like the Army Reserves model for volunteering, um, where people will get um, will get recompensed for their time, but also the employer will get supported, um, so that we have a better engagement between the employer, the volunteer, and the agency. And there's some examples of. Uh, of councils currently in South Australia and working with the uh, SA Ambulance Service where they have people on call who are working within the council who can be on call for that ambulance. Very interesting. So they don't have to, but... Yes, they don't have to take time away from work um, and work is supporting them in that process. Um, That's so I very think interesting. Of... Yeah, because I, I think too, um, you know, often um, people would go volunteering because they want to improve self-esteem and part of that self-esteem is that they get acknowledgement. They don't just get the internal feel good. They actually, when they get legitimacy as a real community member, um, that's also an important aspect. I'm thinking, Jennifer, what's your thought about what we need to build on or do differently? Well, I was um, nodding my head as Natalie and, and Simon were talking. Um, I'd probably just add with the the idea of volunteering and uh, what's been mentioned about uh, with new people coming into the community and, you know, different age groups, getting them encouraged to um, take on the roles um, as a volunteer. I would probably just say mentorship, uh, where I mentioned it before about more from that workforce uh, but when I said paid or volunteer I think this is something to consider as well is that this would be um, to build capacity within the volunteer space is for those um, old members of the community who are long-term volunteers and know how to operate everything uh, you know where some communities have particular uh, centres that they've been running for a long time uh, is working out how to uh, build interest with the newer members coming into the community and um, showing them what, you know, as you mentioned before, is that, you know, what volunteerism can bring to you as a person. But it's also having someone that can mentor them and, and actually build their uh, confidence in stepping forward um, into that volunteer role. So I'd probably just say that that would be something to look at is that it's not just from a paid workforce but from a volunteering point of view, how can you um, build mentorship within the community to encourage people to get excited about, yep, yeah, look, if you come on board, this is what um, this role in this volunteering role will bring to the community and to yourself as well. Yes, and I'm thinking that will build the social connections perhaps across different cohorts that might not normally be together as well. Very intergenerational. And that also, fantastic. Um, and, of course, Natalie, what are your thoughts about build, what we need to build on or do differently? Yeah, um, some of those comments have just got me thinking about, you know, the diversity um, of representation as well and who we, and, the, you know, age is one, gender is another, um, cultural diversity is another, um, yeah. and, you know, that diversity is really critical. Um, one of the, um, I mean, 
One of the initiatives that we've supported um, in the last round of the Networks program was um, an ag network for women. Uh, and interestingly, they held their first event. They had about 86 people attend. Half of them were new people to the region um, and hadn't engaged with that network or with each other before. Um, and um, I think almost all of them, speaking to the age diversity piece, were aged between 25 and 40. So there's something about how you design things for people in the right time of day with the right support mechanisms, um, you know, in the right place so that you actually invite in that diversity and encourage um, people, um, particularly in that younger cohort and particularly women who wear so many hats and have so many roles in their lives. Um, so, you know, and that that included a whole range of, um, you know, all of the, the features that we know help build resilience around communication, information, provision, relationship, development, mentorship. Um, but, you know, just that kind of, those numbers are really quite astounding. Um, there's another initiative that um, I attended a few years ago, which uh, was a bit of a game changer for me in how I understood how resilience kind of works in a remote setting. And that was um, uh, the Red Ridge Interior Channel Country Ladies Day. I don't know if anyone's been to one of those, but they're just brilliant. Um, and for women living in the outback, uh, you know, that isolation is pretty intense um, mm. and particularly going through dry years and drought, um, you know, access to services is really difficult. Looking after your own health um, is really difficult, your own physical health, your mental health, um, the ability to connect with others. So, you know, it's those sort of things we need to invest in, I think, and they're not hard and they don't cost a lot. Look, guys, you have really given us a fairly rich overview of some of the critical issues that you've experienced and bringing your expertise to us to share today, some lovely examples. Um, you've talked about the importance of uh, the um, in being dynamic in the way in which we're embracing capacity to change, the importance of soft and hard infrastructure, the importance of connecting across diverse social cohorts, the importance of preparing and investing for the uh, upcoming drought before it arrives. In fact, probably any particular crisis that might hit community, not just drought. And um, you talked about very much about volunteering and mentoring being a vehicle to provide support in developing that social fabric. And, um, and some of the things that can support by allowing communities to identify what they need to build opportunities to embrace diversity and, and to be more inclusive. Thank you, Simon, Natalie and Jennifer for your wonderful in input today. And um, back to you, Andy, for the Q&A. Uh, thanks very much, Selena. Uh, going to the questions in just a moment, if I may be in, on indulgence as someone who worked in regional media, I just wonder whether the decline of regional media, particularly regional commercial media, regional television, where everyone saw their community reflected back at them every night, they had their grand finals, you had your telethons and all the rest of it, that that has undermined how people feel about their communities. And it's, there's a big discussion at the moment about regional media in print and in uh, electronic media. So I just, that's a comment rather than a question, but I, I felt, I think it's something that has had an unforeseen impact, the networking from capital cities. Whereas 30, 40 years ago, Shepparton had a morning show yeah, on yeah. GMV6. I think, yeah, I think I I, I will just add quickly just there add that quickly. it is very important that rural communities feel that they're seen by city communities because otherwise they feel that they're the other. And they can, even though there is tremendous support from city communities and urban communities in providing uh, um, support to rural communities struggling in drought, there is still sometimes a sense that they are under attack when people have changing values around animal welfare or tree clearing or environmental resource stewardship or, you know, all those issues, which rural people can feel isolates them a little bit from being part of the whole of Australia and being honoured and respected for their very good and positive initiatives that they have. But the other panel members might also have a comment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Simon. I certainly agree, but... I but also, you know, we've seen the rise of social media and the ability for communities to be mm -hmm. even more engaged now than, than perhaps they were. Um, and, uh, and, but I think that sometimes comes back to the skill set within that local progress association of someone who's running their, uh, 
you know, they're on uh, their, their blog site or their or their Facebook page, or um, so uh, so so it has a pros pros and cons. Um, but certainly, I agree the the downfall of um, regional media is impacting. Um, but I can see the growth in social media and a better acceptance of that as being a way to overcome it. Hyper local is the way to go. The way to go now is to some questions to you all. Uh, Robert Cancans is asking. Do you think community resilience can be measured consistently? And if so, how? Can you measure resilience? That's a bit of a curly one. Who can speak to that? I reckon Natalie will have, a go, Natalie will have a go at that one. Natalie and Jennifer, I see, <laughs> hands up. I can't tell you how many, times, how many um, times I've had this conversation. Um, Look, I, my question is, my comment and response is less about um, whether you can, it's whether you should. Um, uh, I, I often wonder what value that brings. You know, why, why are we so uh, obsessed with measuring something? And as I said when we opened the conversation, that I think is really about a set of quite dynamic characteristics and conditions in a community. Um, you know, if we're to measure it, it should be highly qualitative, in my view, and it should be deeply anchored in a place and in context. Uh, and, you know, it, it should be about the strength of the connections um, and the, the areas that we need to put more focus on. And so I think that measurement can become a dangerous tool in the context of, um, you know, that, that lens of resilience being highly hyper-localised but also contextualised to a place and, and its dynamicism. Um, so it's my view is um, you could, but it probably wouldn't add much value and it might actually present as um, quite risky to some degree. But I think if we talk about understanding um, how to actually put resources to best use so that we strengthen communities, that's a, that's a different piece. Yeah, I've just... Uh, I've, well, Simon? I've, I've just posed a question I've that... Posed. Uh, uh, that we're looking at for our, I'll, I'll come back to volunteering, uh, our volunteering conference for, for later this year. Uh, I'll just pose the question of, we need sometimes to put a dollar value on what the impacts are going to be if we're going to get policymakers to start to think about why they should be actively involved in this. So if we were to see a, uh, a 10 to 30% and decrease in volunteers, volunteerism in, in in regional South Australia, what's the financial impact that's going to have on our communities and on our levels of government to provide that level of service? So I think there are ways of, of, of measuring um, and uh, certainly I think to help us in that advocacy role. And Jennifer, did you have something you wanted to contribute there? Uh, yeah, just very quickly, um, just to follow on from um, the other comments, uh, I also uh, agree that it's it's a bit dangerous if you go, you know, uh, one way of measuring resilience um, across all communities. But I would suggest um, with resilience for a, any community, um, it's always good to look at what the um, statistics are in that community for workforce engagement. So, you know, how many jobs are available to how much engagement there is happening, uh, health services uh, and also in community engagement. So looking at across that whole wellbeing employment side, uh, because if you can see that there is, um, there's a bit of a shift happening in those um in those stats for a particular community, that would be where you could pick up on whether or not that there was something that needed to be looked at to build the resilience for that community. So it's really, I would just be saying, it's looking at overall, but I, I completely agree about a very strong qualitative approach as well, because you have to listen to what the issues are from the people in that community. Yeah, beware of the spreadsheet, eh? Um, Sue Middleton is asking, does anyone have any women's health initiatives uh, that build resilience? Uh, and do they have any demonstrable results? Are there any specific things there that can be addressed? Anyone want to talk to that one? 
I think a couple of the examples that I shared earlier, um, particularly the likes of Channel Country Ladies Day, which I know has been evaluated um, and has got some pretty um, solid evidence around it um, in terms of the health outcomes and um, benefits for the women who participate in that event. Um, and, you know, the, the likes of um, women's health organisations in rural communities working across quite critical um, intersecting issues around things like family violence, housing, etc., cetera, um, workforce participation, um, you know, access to childcare, all of those things that can sort of enable or hinder um, the contribution of women to our communities and, and their resilience um, have got a lot of great um, models and evidence. So I definitely encourage anyone to engage with those women's health organisations that um, operate across the regions as well. One of the one of the things we've been one of the things we've been looking at is when we've run forums or conferences, um, we've then provided an opportunity for those women who have come as keynote speakers from outside the region to then stay on and be involved in some women's networking events. So actually giving giving the excuse for those communities to come together. Um, uh, using off the off the back of um, having those keynotes who have come in um, has given us an opportunity, I think, to start to build that network, which hasn't always been so, which hasn't been there for the last few years, and whether we've seen again the downfall of things like uh, the um, the decline in in the CWA and uh, and programs like that to actually give the excuse for people to come together. As we wrap up our conversation here, Selena, can I ask you, you, you chaired the conversation, the panel just now, do you feel the conversation's in the right place? We've been, people have talked about using the right language when you walk into a room and all that kind of thing. Are we getting better at, at listening, better at speaking and better at acting upon those two actions? Uh, I think that's a challenging question. I think there is definitely a greater awareness about putting people in the middle of it. When in the past we've perhaps focused on uh, making policy decisions based purely on dollars and budgets and um, rather than on what are the outcomes that we want for rural and regional Australia. And if we're looking at that, then it's critically important to think about what rural people want for themselves in their own communities and how can we support that. Um, as as um, I, 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 there are issues that have been mentioned about mindset and we often think about rural people's mindset, but I think there's also opportunities for us as service providers to shift our mindsets as well. And there's obviously awareness of that through this hub um, to make sure that we are that we are working towards that um, hyper local, as Natalie and Simon and Jennifer have mentioned. Uh, focus, which shows respect for those communities. And that's an empowering attitude, I think. Um, so for us to be very mindful of our place in in that is, uh, is I think we are going, where we are getting there. <laughs> I think there is evidence we're, we're becoming more self-aware. I think that's a great place to wrap it all up. This has been a splendid conversation. Thank you for chairing the panel, Selena, and to Natalie, Jennifer and Simon, thank you for your contributions and being part of the Future Drought Fund Science to Practice Forum. Have a great thank rest you. of the thank day. You. Thank you. And now the end is near, both for day two, but also for our trips around Australia looking at the hubs. We've produced videos from all the hubs around the place. We've just got one left. And if you've been keeping a note or paying attention, you'll know that our remaining hub to go on show is Victoria. In a moment, we'll be hearing from the recently installed hub director, Michael Towes. But first, the video. So let's get on the road one last time. People do know Dookie very well. Everyone knows that when we're talking about the hub, we're talking about Dookie. We have a commercial farm here, nearly 2,500 hectares, 
and it really is the sort of farming system that we're saying actually has some very good attributes around drought resilience. There's never been a team in Victoria comprising Agriculture Victoria, four universities and five farming industry groups that's worked together on anything collectively. And here we are, we've put this amazing team, it, it, you know, it's a powerhouse team. I think one of the biggest advantages of being involved in the hub and being a node leader is you get access to an incredible network of farming systems groups as well as universities and other organisations that are involved like the state government is as well. And as a small farming systems group, that network is just so valuable, that insight that we can get that's a much bigger footprint than what we have in our own area can really drive innovation and get creative solutions to really tricky problems that we deal with in agriculture. The containment project that I'm working on is going to give people an idea on how they can implement containment feeding and the different purposes it might have on their farming system. Containment feeding can be used in many more ways than just in a drought and when they need to get that stock off. It is trying to integrate it as part of a farming system, whether you're a mixed farming and you've got crops that you need to get those stock off the stubble so you can get prepared for the next crop, or whether it's about giving your pastures a rest and letting them get away a bit whilst maintaining your flock numbers and the nutrition of your livestock. We've already been able to use uh, knowledge and experience from the drought hub in our teaching but also, of course, in research. Uh, so for us, we have quite a number of postgraduate students working on drought and heat stress in, in both uh, crops and in livestock. So we are at one of the trial sites with Future Drought Fund Innovation Grant. We are evaluating cereals, uh, legumes, and oilseed crops. We want to demonstrate that a diversified production system is a better option when we want our growers to manage and cope with production stresses such as drought. So a production system which is primarily reliant on wheat and canola rotation system probably is not the best way forward. We would like to demonstrate and evaluate that when legumes such as they are part of production system or when we consider crops like wheat for grazing grain so that we have diversified income sources are better options. If you look at, at what, what the Australian government charged us with in terms of the hubs, it was about innovation and not business as usual. One of the key aspects we are asked to look at is building resilience in rural communities. And so, you know, there are many aspects there, and one that has been demonstrated, not for drought, but for communities under stress, is the role of creative arts. Creative arts can certainly break down barriers, and the playful tactics that we use in art, and this use of imagination and use of speculation, can certainly break down those barriers. But I suppose also we're saying that we're trying to imagine into these unpredictable climate futures related to drought, what a future drought might look like. And together we can use speculation and imagination to try and think about, to visualize and to actualize more positive ways of living through drought and even thriving through drought. So I believe that we've built a real legacy because these partnerships now is on trust and, and, and these teams you know, will work together uh, into the future. So I'm very happy that we've, it's been a lot of work putting it all together. It's been exhilarating to do it. Yeah, feeling good about it. Former Hub Director Professor Tim Reeves with the last word on our video and Tim recently handed over to Michael Towers and Michael joins us now from Dookie. How are you going Michael? So hello from hello. the Dookie campus of the University of Melbourne. We are here on Yorta Yorta country 
and I would like to introduce uh, Susie Fraser, who will represent the Victoria Hub with, I think, something a bit different. Uh, Susie is the coordinator of the Centre of Visual Arts at the University of Melbourne's Faculty of Fine Arts and Music. And especially relevant to this uh, presentation here, she also, among many other things, she leads the um, Art and Ecology Residence here at the Duke campus. And as part of that, she started a project uh, supported by the uh, Victoria Hub and by Melbourne Climate Futures about creativity and community resilience. And she will talk to you about that. And she will be supported by Elizabeth Evans and Andrew Sands, co-designers of that project uh, from the local regional community here. And I give a pass on to Susie. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's great to be joining today uh, from the Duki campus on Yorta Yorta country. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. This is a wonderful country to be able to work on in my role. And we're fr privileged to be uh, continuing to build connections with Yorta Yorta cultural leaders and campus and community members through this project. I'm incredibly proud to be co-developing the creativity and community resilience studio here at Dukey campus, which is a project we're piloting in partnership with the Victoria Drought Hub and with Melbourne Climate Futures at the University of Melbourne, as Michael said. This project situates creative led strategies and arts practices at the center of efforts to strengthen community resilience. Australia's drought hubs have a mandate of preparing communities for future drought. But as we know, the capacity to access and embed community participation is sometimes hampered by institutional and community divides. This project aims to show the great benefits of creative led approaches to community engagement that have the potential to change the conversation nationally and even globally related to pre preparing communities um, for extreme climate conditions like drought. Um, so I'll just have the uh, next slide, please. Um, this picture was taken in uh, February 2022 and shows some early planning discussions with Dukey community members and University of Melbourne staff in the wonderful old agricultural engineering building here at Dukey campus. So the creativity and community of resilience studio is a sincere exercise in co-creation and collaboration. An underlying impulse of our project is to make space for collaboration between university research related to drought and climate and the diverse and invaluable knowledge is held in the community itself. In essence, this project is creating an ambient campus of sorts through which different knowledges and expertise across campus and community can be brought together. And I was hoping to be able to present to you all this afternoon from the gates to the Dukey campus, um, which would have been a nice demonstration of the liminality uh, that we're discussing here. But unfortunately, as we've already seen, um, we're really playing roulette with this temperamental live stream technology. So. I'm gonna leave it to you to simply visualize an overlapping and very generative space somewhere in between the campus and the community. So we really want to think about how we can bring lots of different knowledges into the same conversation through this project, a conversation that affects us all, how we might experience droughts more positively in the future. It's that simple. And of course, it's incredibly complicated um, as the diverse presentations um, across the Science to Practice Forum are demonstrating. Um, and I've greatly appreciated hearing about all the future drought fund projects over the last two days. And we would love to connect this creative led project at Dukey with any of the hubs and partners who might be interested in being involved. And my contact details for the project are at the end slide. So this project began with a conversation between myself and Professor Tim Reeves, who we just saw in the video at the Victoria Drought Hub. And I believe it was on one day at the Science to Practice Forum, in fact, last year. Tim and I were discussing strategies for researching and facilitating community resilience. And I was telling him about work I had been part of evaluating a four-year program 
of arts and community resilience events developed by Arts House in North Melbourne, which is called Refuge. And um, I'll have the next slide, please. And um, he, here we see a report, the front cover of a report I co-authored on the 2017 Refuge iteration, which was themed around heat waves. And evaluating the successes of the Refuge project in North Melbourne in both connecting with community through art and using art practice um, to imagine more positive ways of dealing with climate related disasters. I was led to think more about how the learnings from that program and our research around it could be valuable when translated to a regional context, focusing on future drought. And we've been grateful to receive initial funding uh, from Melbourne Climate Futures and the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music at the University of Melbourne to explore this further. Creative arts practice is able to facilitate processes, processes of collaboration, bringing people together and breaking down barriers by using playful, imaginative techniques. Um, and I have the next slide, please. Um, this is a picture of me actually participating in a wonderful participatory artwork uh, titled Apotherapy Quarantine by the Melbourne-based artist Jen Ray. And you see me here looking a bit stark in contrast to the SES members. Um, this was part of the 2018 iteration of Refuge, which was take place at Arts House. In the project at Dukey, we're using participatory art as well as a playful entry point to get people involved in the very serious topics of drought, climate change, and agricultural futures. But more than this role in um, breaking down barriers, creative practice and thinking is absolutely crucial for us to imagine, plan for, and actualize futures which we can't predict. We need to harness imagination and speculation to be able to visualize um, and kind of work towards better futures than the ones we have left behind. For this pilot, project at Dookie. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we are working closely with two brilliant local community members and business owners are here with me today, Liz Evans and Andrew Sands, um, who have been mediators for us in connecting with an incredibly broad network of residents in the region. With Liz and Andrew's help, we've been fortunate enough to involve your Yorta leaders, including Neville Atkinson and art curator Belinda Briggs, regional farmers, including a uh, former farmer, in Andrew himself, uh, a local network of creatives and ecologists and scientists from the campus to be involved in the project. And here you can see us um, in our first gathering of the working group in March 2022, sitting outside um, on a late summer's evening and getting to know each other. Collectively, we, uh, the working group, community members and campus members, are going to imagine and act out what a positive experience of drought might look like sometime in the near future. And we have three upcoming workshops in which we'll be bringing our, our collective ideas together, writing down and recording our knowledges, and planning for a semi-performative dinner together in September of this year, which we have been calling broadly our Dinner for the Future. This shared meal will be staged 10 or 15 years in the future and will foreground indigenous knowledge and ecology. It will also draw on radical hospitality methodologies um, whereby all the participants at the dinner are contributing to the hospitality being offered during the meal. So we will be recording and performing, uh, later performing, um, and it will be available for screening and restaging in public forums uh, locally and nationally, maybe even internationally after the event. Um, the second stage of the project, which we are hopeful to be able to facilitate in 2023, will be a large scale participatory exhibition across multiple venues in Victoria, which will draw on the learnings of the Dinner for the Future at Dukey and extend this co-creation approach to think of how we can imagine more spaces in our communities dedicated to creative practice and imagination where, which are accessible to everyone. And these spaces will be designed with future drought conditions in mind, serving as gathering points in which residents, farmers and families can convene for support, play and practice. We have tentatively titled the second stage of the project Making Space for Common Ground. And um, maybe we'll have the last slide, please. 
it's exciting to imagine the impact of this project and many like it which are being carried out all across Australia. Um, the impact it might have on our public policies and strategies going forward, bringing together the knowledges of our communities and academics and industry specialists to tease out a more holistic understanding of how we might navigate crises like drought in the future. Um, and that's kind of my, my part, uh, my more formal presentation done. Um, but I might invite uh, Liz and Andrew to join me on the stage. Um, I'm going to shuffle over to the side. Okay. Um, I'm my pity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and Liz and Andrew, do you want to maybe mention to the audience a bit about um, your experience of drought and your experience of leading um, creative events in in Dukey? Yeah, sure. Um, we um, we had a connection to the area. We ran the local Indigenous seed bank and. We um, ran that seed bank for 14 years and when we, we came into the seed bank, it was about 2003, um, and it was actually about a 10 year drought. So when we came in, it was a very, uh, a very uh, drought time and we worked with farmers, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the work was done with farmers who were doing revegetation um, on their farms. Um, and so um, I suppose that's where we've had our um, experience with with drought mm -hmm. um, and during that time you know we did notice um, you know how hard it was um, during those periods and then um, I suppose um, towards 2014 um, things started to change a little bit um, so we started to get a bit more rain and things in the area um, started to look quite good um, and it was around that time that we got involved in um, a project um, through Regional Arts Victoria um, for a small town transformation grant that mm -hmm. we got um, and it was called Dookie Earthed and so that brought uh, art to town um, and it was quite a big project. I think we ended up with 6,000 people coming to the town for, for that event. Um, and it really lifted um, the town and, and it also opened people's minds to um, that um, art wasn't just a painting on the wall. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah. It involved all different sorts of uh, forms of art from uh, all sorts of creative ways. And, uh, but you know, getting the locals involved was uh, beneficial to everybody, I imagine, for them. and. Uh, and I still talk about it. It's still it's had a ripple effect, and uh, so ongoing little projects have occurred with the full support of the town, and um, over the years since. And uh, I suppose our ten-year anniversary coming up. Have to hear it. Yeah. 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 Earth, but uh, you never know. Yeah. Well, we'll how that might go. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So it was a great concept to involve the. Uh, our beautiful environment, I suppose, and our soils and uh, art together in a funny sort of way. We so, were heavily involved in the soil, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. So we're very excited to be part yeah. of this project. Yeah. 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 It's wonderful to be able to be that conduit between a yeah. local people and this project yeah. uh, and bringing it lots of people together. So yeah, we really appreciate it's it. Very it's very beneficial. It's been, yeah, it's a very everybody. exciting project and we're yeah. So thrilled to be working with Liz and Sanzi and working with the Dukey community and working with the Victoria Drought Hub and hopefully other hubs and other partners as well. Um, we'll wait for the deluge of contacts, hopefully, <laughs> after this presentation. Thanks, Susie. And can I, on a personal note, as someone who actually covered that Dukey Regional <laughs> Arts Victoria story back all those years ago. It was a great initiative which went to five small towns under 1,500 people across Victoria. Oyen was one, I can't remember the other three, but Dukey was the big one in the quarry there. And the whole idea was spend a little, relatively small amount of money, I think it was 350 grand, and something bigger will grow. And look at us now talking about it. Susie, I've got a few questions for you. Great. Um, Great. One of our anonymous uh, questioners is asking, how do you foresee working 
with uh, farming families in the future? Might you be sort of extending your, 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 uh, your territory, so to speak, by going outside the, the, the Dookie College gates? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think we're really keen to be um, developing more partnerships. We were just talking about it before with um, local farming uh, families and farmers. And and to really, I think in the second stage of the project in particular, we will put a really concerted emphasis on perhaps doing projects on farms. Um, obviously, we have the working farm here at Dukey College, at Dukey Campus. Um, but yeah, I think working with um, individual farming stakeholders in the region is going to be a really exciting next phase for the project. Um, and uh, and also kind of working with um, the yeah uh, birdship kind of uh, group and um, and 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 I think um, yeah we're uh, very excited to see how that will develop. Do you want to add to that? Talk to yeah. Talking about next stage, uh, Pamela Allen's just said in a comment, more than a question, but I think it'll hopefully get a reaction. There's strong, there's a strong creative community in Northern Tasmania here which could engage through this model, and yeah. she and she says to Susie in the Victorian Hub, take it on the road. Yes, yeah, we definitely yeah. want to. That's going to be um, a key to the next phase. So thanks for that comment from Tasmania. <laughs> And I'm afraid time has beaten us. Thank you so much to you all at Dookie. It's lovely to see you and to hear you and uh, all the best in your endeavours and have a great dinner in a couple of months time. <laughs> Thank you. So we have visited all the hubs, all the videos are available in the booths and may I just briefly say that uh, you see something of the standard of Australian cinematography in those video videos. We had a number of camera operators operating on those videos around the country, often under difficult conditions because of COVID and other factors, but the images were fantastic and you'll get a chance to see yet more images at the end of the session today. You may have noticed there are rather a lot of dogs in our videos. We have done a best of FDF Hub Dogs closing video. Stay around for that one. But stay around now for our final uh, presentation of this day two. And we're talking about the, the need to strengthen connections between younger farmers and their knowledge and support networks. And helping us find out more about that is uh, Amanda Scott, who's the Program Manager of Farming Together. And Farming Together was born out of the Farm Cooperatives and Collaboration Pilot Program, a $15 million program funded by the Commonwealth Government. It fostered innovative collaborative models such as cooperatives to help farmers, fishing and forestry groups tackle supply chain issues. We all know about those these days. Drought and climate change deliver triple bottom line benefits. And uh, Amanda is going to help us uh, look at this with the uh, assistance of Naomi Schultz, who's a farmer. I'm going to hand you over for our last uh, presentation of the day. And don't forget, keep the questions coming in for the Q&A in about 10 minutes time. Over to you, uh, Amanda. Thank you very much. And I'm definitely going to hang on to make sure I see that dog compilation video at the end. Uh, looking forward to that. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, we've made it almost to the end of the day and what a great day it's been. Um, as uh, the, in the great introduction, I'm Amanda Scott. I work in the Farming Together program and Regen Ag Alliance at Southern Cross University and my project partner here, Naomi Schultz, who's the executive officer from the Ag Innovation and Research Air Peninsula Group, Air EP. Uh, I just want to start by acknowledging the First Nations owners of the land I'm speaking from, and that's the Widjibal people of the Bungjalung Nation. And just to pay my respects to the elders, past, present and future, for they hold the memories, culture and wisdoms that have been passed down for hundreds of generations. And really want to make sure that we use this space to unite people in all walks of life and learn from one another on our journey towards growth, healing and reconciliation. So the project that Naomi and I are going to talk about today is funded by the Future Drought Fund, supported by the Foundation for Rural Regional Renewal Networks to Build Drought Resilience Program. 
Uh, it's a really exciting program. Well, we think it is. Um, we want to share it with you today. We're about three quarters of the way through this project. Uh, there's been so much exciting stuff that we could share but with 10 minutes, you're going to get just a taster today. So we'd love to connect with you with any follow-up comments or questions. Um, there's two key things we'd like you to take away from this presentation. And the first one is for those who don't know much about social network analysis and network mapping, would really like to give you a bit of an intro to this powerful tool because it's really intuitive to use. It's a really great conversation starter and it can help people consider their connections in sort of new and different ways. And then secondly, for anyone working with young farmers, I hope some of the things that you hear from our presentation really resonate with your experiences and maybe some of the suggestions that young farmers have provided in this project inspire you to try something new in your community. So the aim of this project was to identify ways to strengthen connections between young farmers and their information and support networks. And as we've, there's a lot of themes today, it's talking about building resilience in communities. So let's start with the bad news uh, and hopefully finish up with some good news. So what we know from research is that information and support networks really underpin those new ideas that are necessary for innovation and the practice change that's needed to build more resilient communities. But we also know um, that young farmers in the Air Peninsula region in South Australia, if you don't know where that is, that's on the map there, they aren't using the networks as effectively as they could be. And that's a problem that um, my colleague, that's a problem um, that because my colleague, Dr. Hannah Beth Luke from SCU, through her work on the 2020 Soil CRC social benchmarking study found that young farmers in the Air Peninsula region felt the least supported of all age groups surveyed to undertake drought resilient practices on their farm. We also found through this project that young farmers had fairly narrow networks for information sharing, which meant that they're interacting with the same type of people who don't always hold that new information that's needed to shape new thinking. We also found that their support networks, especially their, their personal support networks, are becoming more vulnerable as there are fewer neighbours as farm sizes grow and the use of internet the use of internet based exchanges actually decreases the opportunity to facilitate those important face to face interactions that can really encourage adoption change. And so building strong social and professional networks is really a fundamental to what can be a really isolated profession, um, especially in remote, more remote areas like some of the Air EP areas. But there's good news as well. So Hannabeth's survey found that 100% of the young landholders, that was 18 to 39, were really open to new ideas in farming. In combination, we know, we've seen it over and over again, that, that rural communities, they share information, they provide support, that's at the heart of what they do. The thing is that this is often done really intuitively without being conscious or strategic and deliberate in how you can shape your network to achieve those goals. So there's real, really significant capacity in those young farmers and supporting organisations like Air EP to better tap into and utilise those networks to enhance the individual and collective outcomes. And there's even better news, and that is there's an easy way to help people better understand their networks. This is Air EP's lovely network that they mapped through this project. Um, so we're going to show you uh, uh, this easy way today, and it's called network mapping. And it's a proven method and tool that uncover hidden patterns and connections across the network. It gives you a visual representation of large amounts of information so that you can actually see your network. And one thing we know from research is that intuition only gets us so far. So we can kind of get a sense of up to 10 connections, but beyond that, we're actually quite inaccurate in, in knowing what our network looks like. So we, um, with Air EP and the young farmers, we gave them the opportunity to better understand their networks through the mapping process. And I have to say, 
they, they really grasped it. Like they could straight away draw in their networks, see where the gaps were. They noticed the overlaps. They saw the opportunities. And I'm going to ask uh, Naomi just in a little while to talk about what her experience was like with that mapping process. So here are the maps, again, Airy P in the middle and then some of the young farmer information and support networks that they mapped. And during this mapping process, we asked uh, both groups to think about things like, is there diversity in your connections or are they too, too much the same? Um, are there too many connections or maybe there's not enough connections to, to do what you need to do to achieve your goals? Are there important connections that are missing? What does your map look like compared to your neighbour? And then we took AREP and the Young Farmers through a series of sense-making workshops where we talked about the maps, got a deeper understanding of the networks and started to strategize about things that they could do to help build and strengthen their networks. So Naomi, I'll just um, hand over to you and I just wanted you uh, to, I guess, share your experience with the mapping process and, and if any of the findings surprised you and how you might feel you might take those forward and use those findings. Yeah, so um, I was not real sure at first, to be honest. Um, Amanda came to me with this brilliant idea based on the this social survey, um, benchmarking survey results. I was like, how the hell are you gonna do this? And it was really fun which that okay so that surprised me um what also surprised me was how well the young farmers engaged in the process like they got into it um they're all a bit oh what is this thing that we've been roped into what are we getting ourselves into how is this going to all work um but ultimately through the process um we learned quite a bit about how they want to receive their information um what sorts of information they're looking for um, and how we can better support them. Um, and doing the REP map itself made me realise I'm juggling a lot of relationships, um, but I'm also juggling a lot more now that there's things like the Soil CRC has added a whole new level um, as an example to, to the connections that we have. Like I wouldn't have met Amanda unless without that program. And now through the Future Drought Fund, I feel like the same thing's gonna happen that as we all get together and share our projects, um, I'm hoping that those networks also expand out even further. So um, REP role is basically to bring any useful information for our farmers back and, and put that through their networks. But the real key things that we're gonna try in the short term um, are the ideas that the farmers came up with directly. And that was to um, run a small podcast series where a young farmer will talk to an older farmer um, that they respect or, or someone else in the industry that they respect and interview them as a podcast. So that's, we're trying to get them on board um, to do that themselves. So also building capacity within the young farmers. And um, it's also exciting for our younger REP team members as well to um, build their skills and capacity in that area too. So it's, it's working for all of us at this stage. Brilliant. Thanks, Naomi. I'll um, just move to the next slide. Great. So, yeah, Naomi suggested one of the ideas, uh, mentioned one of the ideas that came out from um, those young farmer um, ideas. So we basically, after the network mapping process, we asked them to talk about what are the strategies, now that you understand your networks, what are the strategies that maybe we can implement to better engage um, you guys and also those young farmers that aren't actually engaging currently. So we've sort of broadly got seven top tips. And as I said, this is just a really quick snapshot. So uh, any other information, happy to share. The first one was face to face. They didn't really even mind what the content was. They just felt like small group, localized, comfortable settings like on a farm face to face was really important. The second tip was leverage what exists. So there were some great ideas about getting local businesses to support and sponsor initiatives. Um, also accessing some of those existing networks like the Ag Bureau networks were, were some of the suggestions that they made. They wanted to cover a variety of topics. So it wasn't just about production topics. Some things that were mentioned were like um, 
what questions do I ask my accountant when I go to see them? So, so things like that. But also one of the things that came up was a in, real interest in um, getting training in leadership, negotiation and conflict resolution because succession planning problems seem to see, be some of the biggest barriers for not being able to engage, not getting support from other family members. Um, and that was further supported with a creative, create passive ways to engage so that those who can't come along to the events can still be part of the community. Um, local, utilise local champions was definitely spoken about a lot, especially that those older innovative farmers they look up to in the community, they really love picking their brain and they wanted to ask them a lot of questions. Uh, Focus on strengthening support networks. I think, Naomi, this might be one that came out from you guys. So more than just a service that is about uh, sharing great information, it's really fundly got to fundamentally value uh, add to be underpinned by also focusing on strengthening their support that you provide to these young farmers. Um, and the last one was using the right communication tools. So uh, Hannah Beth, Dr. Hannah Beth Luke's survey actually found, for example, that there was a significant difference between the old farmer and young farmer's use of tools like email and Twitter, and we definitely found them talking a lot about Twitter and YouTube in our forum discussions. And so as Naomi said, we have uh, their top thing they wanted to implement and we're going to trial through this project is the development of a young farmer, old farmer podcast series. We haven't come up with a cool name yet. So if you've got any suggestions, we'd love to hear them. Um, and we really hope that through this program, uh, the young farmers will be mentored and trained professionally to do interviewing. So build those skills and hopefully Air EP can build some capacity in that space too. Um, but we'd love to see those young farmers uh, eventually becoming those older champions themselves through this initiative. We're also working through this project on co-designing co a suite of capacity building strategies that have been developed through this process and young farmers have had a significant voice in this in this process so that EP can roll out these strategies, enabling the networks to continue to strengthen and endure beyond this project. Um, so that's it from us. We just really want to acknowledge the funding that we, we couldn't do this project without it. We're very grateful and uh, love to hear any comments, questions or feedback. Thank you. And thank you, Amanda. We've got just time for a couple of questions. One from Lisa Yorkston. What methods of passive engagement have you and your young farmers found work the best? Ooh. Are you still finding out? Passive engagement. What do you think, Naomi? Well, that will be the podcast and, and that'll be our opportunity to try that. And um, we'll certainly be doing some evaluation from the farmers directly about how they thought that that was worth engaging with. Yeah, one of the the idea, the passive engagement idea actually came from one of the young farmers themselves who said that they'd attended a, um, a webinar at night and he'd seen a lot of the local guys online who don't usually come to events. So through that process, that's we've, we thought, oh, that's something that we know that works. And then the podcast was the, the most exciting idea for those young farmers. And one from uh, Christine uh, Augie here. In the mapping exercise, how was unconscious bias handled? so people could further expand their networks and experiences. Was unconscious bias part of your uh, thought patterns as you put that all together? Um, um, I'm not really sure. We There was a lot of discussion. So there, there's a lot of, um, I guess, a lot of comparing the networks between the young farmers really got them to challenge themselves and start thinking and exploring and pushing beyond what they they knew themselves. So I think that process sort of sort of cross discussion and comparison really addressed some of those kind of issues. And the clock has beaten us. Amanda, Naomi, lovely to hear from you. All power to your elbow. And anyone with a podcast title suggestion, contact, contact the podcast team. There may even be a prize. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. And so we end the second day of the Future Drought Fund Science to Practice Forum. And here to wrap up the day, 
I'm delighted to welcome to the table here in Canberra, Lynn O'Connell, who's Deputy Secretary at the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. Two days, one day to go, a lot yeah. going on. What would you like to say and how are you seeing this event and how it fits into a much bigger picture? Absolutely. Well, thank you. And um, thank you everyone for your contribution to this year's Future Drought Fund Science to Practice Forum. So we've seen some really remarkable presentations over the last two days, and all, as was the case last year, an awful lot of chat in the chat sessions, an awful lot of connections made between people. And that's, that's fabulous to see because it's more than what happens in these few days. Those connections will continue on. So just to recap on a few things that we've heard about um, that the Future Drought Fund is investing in, first of all, more resilient communities. So that's about growing local leaders and networks to get ready for future droughts. Secondly, better drought risk management planning. So helping farmers to improve their financial stability to build their drought resilience. And thirdly, the practice change, which is what the name of this mm -hmm. forum is really about. And so that's supporting the adoption of tools and practices known to reduce the impacts of drought and that have uh, a real evidence base to them. It's been very heartening to see the future drought fund programs are giving our farmers um, and our regional communities the sort of innovative tools that are actually needed and practices in order to be more resilient to future droughts. It's always easier to talk about drought when it's pretty wet out there and, uh, and raining, but this is the time to prepare and to prepare to be more resilient in terms of future um, droughts. We've also been able to see the progress with the eight uh, future Drought Fund uh, Innovation Hubs, which is fantastic, now known as Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hubs, and see how they're working together to help regions become ready for the next drought. Now, last year's forum, they told us about their intentions in terms of the hubs, and a year on, we've seen some magnificent increase in capability and development and outreach. There's also been significant additional funding to be able to expand, including funding of adaptation officers or adoption officers, the regional soil coordinators, who I heard made mention of in the last session, and much more collaboration on projects across all of the eight hubs. So I'm really uh, impressed with the progress that the hubs have made particularly having gone through a sort of pandemic phase when they were first started and the way that they're leveraging each other's capabilities and learnings to achieve success across the whole nation. Now we've maximised, as I said, these last two days, taking on new ideas and, and sort of forging new networks, both in person and online, but there's more to come. There's day three, as you, you mentioned, one more day of the forum to go. And so day three, tomorrow, the final day, um, those, those of you in our regions will get an opportunity to go on some field trips hosted again by your local hubs. And there's a couple I'll give a shout out and mention to, but the, um, the Southern New South Wales hub is launching a, a new node. The Victoria Hub is doing a guided tour of some of the trial sites. The um, Tropical North Queensland Hub is heading to the Richmond Field Days, um, just to name a few things that the various different hubs have on for tomorrow. And I'm looking forward to hearing back your reports on those final days and those field events for, for day three. Now, for those who are not attending in person, um, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the online networking sessions tomorrow where you can meet in much smaller groups um, and interact with the different Future Drought Fund program leaders to find out about what are future opportunities sort of lay in wait for you. So in closing, on behalf of all of my colleagues at the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, um, thank you for participating in this year's forum. And whether you are an audience member or a participant or a presenter or part of the fabulous organising team, 
Everyone has really generously contributed to this year's event to make the forum a great success. And I look forward to seeing you at next year's event. So in your diaries, you can mark out the date 6, 7, 8th of June, 2023. And um, so please stay safe, travel well, those of you who are traveling, um, and really stay engaged in turning sort of science into practice. So thank you. Lynn, thank you so much, and thank you for doing my job of setting up tomorrow. That was a fantastic spruik. Don't forget, email your feedback, fdfhubs at awe.gov.au. Lynn was talking about some of the things happening tomorrow. People have been out and about already um, and posting their pictures with the hashtag Future Drought Fund. I think we can show you a bit of an event last evening at Olga Downs, where the TNQ hub had a barbecue. What a spectacular place to have a barbecue. Hashtag Future Drought Fund. Thanks for your patience and your good natured attendance today as we wrestled with some dodgy internet, some tab issues, but we got there in the end. And as always on these occasions, some phrases jump out during the day. Phrases like, the soil is the building block, but everything we do. Collaborate, don't duplicate. Evidence attracts investment. Break the cycle of disadvantage. Voice, truth, healing. Lumps and bumps. Come with me into the grey, getting comfortable with the uncertainty. We also discovered that musical theatre and community drought resilience can be two sides of the same coin. Put people at the centre, beware of fluff and jargon, and as Lynn said just now, it's more than what happens in these few days. Thank you so much for your company today. We'll be back again for a very different day tomorrow, but we'll leave you with some canine contributors to this future drought fund. Have a great Wednesday. Go Blues.